Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Awakening Our Democracy, Immigration, and the Nation Now. I'm Suzanne Goldberg, Executive Vice President for University Life, and so pleased to welcome all of you, everybody who's on video, and our panel here today. So today is a campus conversation about immigration in the United States, where we are, and what lies ahead. We've got an amazing panel. I'll introduce them in a moment. First, I want to say a couple of words about the Office of University Life and about the Awakening Our Democracy series. So the Office of University Life, as I hope you know, is your hub for university-wide student life information, for university-wide campus conversations and discussions like today's. We bring together students from across the university, faculty from across the university, and staff from throughout Columbia for conversations about disparities, justice, and pressing issues of our time. And that is really the centerpiece of a, the Awakening Our Democracy series, which is now in its fifth year. Please check the Columbia Web, the University Life website, our social media, and the University Life app for all you need to know about upcoming events. Now, it couldn't be more timely to have our inaugural Awakening Our Democracy series of this year on immigration. One of the things that's especially striking is that last year, really almost exactly a year ago, we had an awakening our democracy conversation about immigration as well. Why have another? Because the changes in this past year have been quite extraordinary in ways that our panel will talk about. From dire conditions for undocumented immigrants trying to cross the southern border, to decrease in legal access for migrants from throughout the world, including as, uh, refugees and asylum seekers, the U.S. government has in, has in, has implemented immigration policies that have really changed the landscape in substantial ways that are worth thinking about, talking about, and exploring. And that will be the focus of today's conversation. What are these policies? What's happening on the ground? How do we think about them from a variety of perspectives that our, our panelists will be here today? And I'll introduce them now. So we have, um, why don't you hold your hands up when I say your names? Uh, David Grasso, right journalist here. and di media director of Gen Biz, a nonprofit dedicated to helping young people understand money and entrepreneurship and the interaction between politics and the general economy. He has interviewed thousands of startup founders for millions of viewers on his weekly digital news show, Bold TV. And David has spent years working as a bi bilingual investigative journalist at Telemundo and ABC local affiliates before specializing in political economy and entrepreneurship. Van Tran, in the middle, hey there, uh, is Associate Professor of Sociology at the CUNY Graduate Center. Professor Tran's research focuses on the integration of immigrants and their children, ethnic and racial categories, diversity and intergroup relations, and neighborhood gentrification, as well as social poverty and inequality. Uh, Professor Tran is an immigration scholar and an urban sociologist uh, who um, I encourage you to read his work as well as, frankly, the work of everybody uh, up here. Uh, his research and teaching are deeply connected to the diversity, history, and vibrancy of New York City. Professor Tran re uh, recently taught here at Columbia University where he received the 2018 Presidential Teaching Award for Excellence in Teaching and the 2017 Faculty Mentoring Award. Elora Mukherjee is the Jerome L. Green Clinical Professor of Law and founding director of the Center for Immigrants' Rights at Columbia Law School and is a national leader in immigration law reform efforts. Professor Mukherjee became especially well known this summer. You probably saw her on TV if you were watching TV at any point during the summer uh, covering immigration uh, for her work as a legal observer at the, uh, the southern border of the United States. She has taken numerous groups of students to the southern border. In January 15th, she, in January 2015, she and her students were the first to provide pro bono counsel for individuals and families seeking uh, asylum in the, in the U.S. Detention Center in Dilly, Texas. Professor Mukherjee regularly collaborates with immigrants' rights advocates on strategic litigation, legislative reform, grassroots advocacy, public education, and coalition building. And Murad Awade, is at the end there? 
uh, is the Executive Vice President for Advocacy and Strategy for the New York Immigration Coalition, where he leads the coalition's community, political, and member engagement departments. Formerly, Murad was the New York, New York Immigration Coalition's Director of Political Engagement, where he read, led federal, state, and local legislative and policy campaigns to push for a more inclusive New York. He's been able to secure over $120 million in funding for low-income communities of color. And he has been featured widely in the media. Um, so really, again, not right now, but afterwards, please do Google everybody. It's quite a remarkable uh, group up here, and he's been recognized in many places for his work. Juju Chang, we are thrilled to have back as our moderator. She, as I'm sure you know, is an Emmy Award-winning television journalist for ABC News and is currently the anchor for Nightline News. Juju has, Juju's work has covered a range of topics from women's health issues, natural and human-made disasters, to presidential elections. She has earned many, many accolades along the way. She is an immigrant herself and also and uh, will be serving as our moderator today. And just a quick reminder of the format, Juju will be our moderator bringing our panelists in conversation with each other. And after, there's, after, so, after a period of time of conversation, we will open up and come back to you. She will open up and come back to you for Q&A. And what we do at that point is ask students to step back to mics or we'll bring mics to you and just introduce yourselves, your name and your question or brief comment and we'll collect a few comments at a time to make sure that as many people as possible have a chance to participate. So Juju, I'll turn it over to you and thank you again to all of you for being here. Before I turn on my mic, why don't you guys um, start by, since my microphone is not on, um, talking about sort of the most pressing issue that you see in the field of immigration. You've taken students down to detention centers. What have you found? It's hard for me to name just one issue, but since you're focusing on children in detention, I'll begin by talking about that. This summer, so I've been working with children in immigration detention centers along our southern border on and off for 12 years now. And this summer, I was again along the border in a small city called Clint, Texas. And a small team of lawyers and I went to the facility to interview the children there. We were authorized to do so under the Flores Settlement Agreement, which provides for basic minimum protections for children in federal immigration custody and requires the prompt release of children as quickly as possible. And the conditions that we found were the most degrading and appalling conditions that I've ever seen in federal immigration custody. We saw children who were dirty, who were hungry, who were scared, who were detained alone, separated from their parents and other family members. How young were the kids that you saw? The youngest who were child I interviewed was five months old. Um, we found children as young as two year old as, as young as two years old who didn't have a family member at Clint to take care of them. So other children who were slightly older were required to take care of the little ones. So guards would bring in the two-year-olds, the three-year-olds, and say to the children who were eight, nine, ten years old, who is going to take care of this one? And it was, it was awful. And where are we on the legal remedies to some of the injustices that you witnessed? On August 23rd, the administration published final regulations seeking to eviscerate the Flores Settlement Agreement, seeking to hold children indefinitely in unlicensed facilities without access for monitors like me to ever go in and interview the kids to see if they're okay. Luckily, I have some good news for you. On Friday, a federal district court in California enjoined those regulations. Everyone expects that the administration will appeal that decision and seek to um, have the regulations take effect. This is the type of case that might reach the Supreme Court. Van, talk to us a bit about what you noted before we took the stage, which is that the speed of change in this space, that in the last three months you've seen vast changes. Describe some of those for us. I mean, just to amplify what Laura just said, um, I think it has been really a crisis along the southern border for all of us because of the massive numbers of people <laughs> fleeing 
the uh, countries where there was tremendous poverty and violence, and specifically three Central American countries, El Salvador, um, Honduras, and Guatemala, which together is referred to as the Northern Triangle. And that's really where this sort of, you know, uh, massive flow of people ended up in the detention center that you just heard about. And I think in so many ways, the change that we observed is in the tremendous amount of pacing, how fast they are coming, and also the ways in which the current administration is responding to it. Literally every other week, you have some new agreement that has been reached between the U.S. government and the kind of Central and Southern uh, America countries. And even Mexico to flow. hold on to the asylum seekers. That's correct. It right. started with Mexico, and then it also expanded to Guatemala and Honduras. And then more recently, I think just two weeks ago, we have now um, reached an agreement with, with um, um, El Salvador as well. And the agreement is simply to say to these countries that you guys are going to be the asylum holding countries. You guys are going to host these people as they're applying for asylum status in the U.S. They shall not be allowed to come into GSO at all. Um, David, let me have you talk a bit. I mean, we're talking about sort of bilateral, multilateral solutions, but you're looking at it from more of a business perspective. Talk about that. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how angry I am that past administrations haven't addressed this problem. We have kicked the can so far down the road that we've been reduced to what you guys were talking about. We had 800,000 dreamers in this country that don't know what's going to happen next. We have families being separated at the border. This was all avoidable. And this is really, I, I blame my parents' generation for not doing anything about this. I blame both parties because this is an outrage. Specifically, Central America has been unstable for a very, very long time. I grew up in Miami. There's a lot of Central Americans in Miami. And this has been going on the Northern Triangle that the professor mentioned, tale as old as time. We know about this. We could have helped fix this a long time ago. And instead, no one did anything about it. And now we're all shocked when we see unspeakable things happen. So I like to look at this from the antecedents. How did we get here? How did we let this go on for so long? Both parties, all of us as citizens. Why, why, why did we wait till now to be outraged? You know, I grew up in a city where a lot of people were undocumented. And I grew up with undocumented people. Why did we wait till 2016 to even think about it? And that to me is the way I approach the whole immigration crisis. This is horrible and there's a lot of things that's going on here, but we ignored it. We'd rather stick our heads in the sand, we'd rather blame X, Y, and Z, but really all of us and both parties are complicit in this problem. Uh, does anybody want to address that? Go ahead. Um, just to add to this, um, the origin actually of the crises um, in the Northern Triangle dated back to the 1950s, roughly up to the 1980s, when the U.S. actively intervened in both the politics and the economy of these three countries specifically. And the political economy at the time was simply that we must support whatever governmental structure we could find or build in these three countries because they were the wall that prevent communism from spreading up north. And that really was how we got involved in the first place, which raised a different question, which is what is our responsibility? Because a lot of these migration flows from Vietnam, from China, from various parts of the world, were often triggered by some type of U.S. intervention. And when you go back two generations, not just one, like David has just mentioned, you saw that we did horrendous things to these countries. And we had, obviously, outsized economic and political power in all of these negotiations. And we were controlling all of these countries from afar, mostly for our benefit. And this has to be placed in the broader context of the Cold War, when the US was the leader of the capitalist bloc. Right, the responsibility the being, if you break it, you own it, which is the foreign policy mm -hmm. cliche. Um, Murad, let me get you into this conversation uh, at the New York Immigration Coalition. You are seeing rapid changes on the ground. Give us a, a status report, if you will. 
Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think that there has been a lot that has changed. And I'm, I don't want to start in 2016, because I feel like that's arbitrary in a way. Um, we have had an enormous amount of issues, as some of the other panelists have already mentioned, that stem not this presidency. Certainly were exacerbated in the last presidency. We're there under Bush. We're there and made worse under Clinton. Um, and all of that is to say is that we've continually stacked the get deck against people, um, specifically immigrants. Uh, in 96, we criminalized uh, immigration when it has been historically a civil issue. Uh, in under Bush, there is a, a little bit of um, leeway that happened um, where people were looking for a solution, but never was one. Under Bush, we had the, under Obama, we had the most deportations in US history. And now under Trump, he's utilized every single system that was put in place before him to do the most harm. And what happens is that you end up having some white supremacists who are in this administration who are doing this as quickly as possible and without regard to the law. Um, and what happens in this uh, past 20, 30 years is that you see it, the impact here locally. Uh, we're a statewide organization. We have uh, members across New York from Buffalo down to the east end of Long Island. And the, we have a border in the state of New York. And I think that sometimes when I tell that to people, they're shocked. They're like, we have a border <laughs> in the state of New York? Yeah, we share a border with Canada. And the things that happen at the border are here in New York are atrocious. And you see Border Patrol um, randomly doing uh, enforcement in some of the, in, across Western and Central New York, and even in the North Country, and specifically targeting people of color. Um, and we see this happen often. You see people who have status now here, and it's a temporary status, crossing over into Canada because they don't feel safe here. Um, here in New York City, we've been a beacon of uh, for immigrants and immigrant communities, and we'll continue to be that um, for the foreseeable future because this, this city has been shaped and shifted within the past history to really continue to thrive based on the populations that are here. Yeah. Um, and just one quick piece on the policy, um, we've seen New York City pretty much lead for the most part on policy for immigrant communities compared to anywhere else in the nation. At the state level, we're catching up. And this past year, we had a number of different wins that are helping us provide uh, support to the communities who've been here for so long who haven't had it. So the temperature check on the ground is that their communities are afraid. They are extremely vulnerable. And they want to have a future for themselves. And coming to a country like the US, which is the wealthiest the wealthiest nation in the world. And I think that there's always this false dichotomy that's created that says we have to take care of our citizens and that's it. And it's that there is no pathway for people who've been here for many years to become citizens first. Second, we are compassionate. We, are, we should be providing support and helping people who are fleeing violence, who are fleeing war-torn countries and who just want a better life. And we are criminalizing that here at our southern border, at our airports, and really making it the hardest place to be right now for immigrants. Uh, you mentioned the deportations and the escalating number. There are a number of tools that are being used um, in this immigration space, whether it's deportation, building a wall, detaining people. Give us the relative pros and cons on the various, because I think people conflate the different issues, whether it's asylum seekers being detained versus people who are being stopped at the border. Give us a sense of what's effective and what you think is not effective. This president, oh, let me turn this back. This administration and this president are trying to close off our borders to immigrants, specifically to asylum seekers, especially those from the Northern Triangle, but as well as other developing countries. And most recently, the Supreme Court authorized the 
closure of the southern border. So the administration had promulgated regulations this summer that effectively close off the southern border to all asylum seekers except for those from Mexico. So if you've read about this in the news, it's called the transit ban. And the transit ban was upheld, was, was authorized to stand by the Supreme Court during the second week of September in an unusual procedural move called an emergency stay pending appeal that the Supreme Court almost never grants. And this has been very effective for ending the ability of asylum seekers and refugees coming through our southern border to enter the country. Uh, the closure of the southern border under that regulation is combined with another new policy called Migrant Protections Protocol, a very Orwellian name that is affecting right now about 50,000 refugees and asylum seekers who are not allowed into the United States but who are being held in Mexico while they wait for their asylum claims to be processed. There have been dozens and dozens of documented murders, rapes, kidnappings, and other very serious harm inflicted on those subject to migrant protection protocols. So these are unfortunately very effective ways that the administration is keeping out refugees and asylum seekers. I was in Honduras uh, about two years ago doing a story about femicide and, and the mix of reasons why there's so much violence. And there does seem to be a correlation to the influx of drugs and weaponry um, into that, the region. And I wonder, I mean, you don't necessarily have to speak to that, but there is a desperation that was caused um, in, in that region. Right, Van? Absolutely. And these people are basically fleeing for their life, which is why they're fleeing and trying to come to the southern border at own cost because if they had an option to turn back, they would. And a lot of these people, for the first time actually in recent history, we're observing families migrating because for a long, long, long time, you know, Mexico-US migration has always been male dominated. And that was an easier way to be processed, an easier population to be processed. And you don't have the situation that you just heard about young babies being detained because, you know, you could detain adult males, and that's a different population altogether. And we at Nightline followed the so-called caravan of families that were traveling uh, to, to the southern border. Um, Dave, you talked about um, penalizing businesses and, and going at other sort of p points of access to try to stem illegal immigration. Well, I think the professor's absolutely right. First, we have to address the problem rather than the symptom. So the migration is a symptom of the problem, which is instability in these countries, okay? So we did a lot of nation building on the other side of the world. Maybe we should focus on stabilizing this area. So first, stabilize the patient. Number two, if you want to disincentivize undocumented immigration, what you need to do is not go after humans. Humans want a job, right? And obviously, if they're migrating here, there are still jobs for them, right? So if you really want to crack down on that, go after employers. The demand will be eviscerated overnight. And I have no idea why that's not part of the conversation. Obviously, we need to figure out something for people who are already here. But if we want to disincentivize more people coming and you know more migration, it's a two-pronged thing. One, stabilize the countries, and two, penalize employers. Um, do you want to add to that, Van? I or? just want to Murad, jump in go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I think a lot of the world's problems have been created by the United States intervening and trying to create nation building. And that has been at the root of a lot of what we're seeing. I think that the U.S., has, our foreign policy, has contributed to the instability and will continue to do that. Um, there is a solution here and there is not a solution. Criminalizing people seeking to have a better life, and I'm not pitting communities against each other. I'm not going to say, oh, we should, Im we should make sure we get more people who are educated into the country. Everyone should have the right to want to live a better life. Point blank. The sentence ends there. That's the period. How that happens, I think that there is a number of different ways it could happen how I see enforcement happening within this country right now is it's happening pretty much we've enabled CBP, we've even enabled Border Patrol, we've enabled ICE and local municipalities who work with them to become pretty much the Gestapo of our time. And what that is doing is it's not only inflicting fear, 
in our communities, but it's also pushing people back into the shadows that it's taking so long to get them to, to want to participate within society, want to get health care so that they are addressing a small issue that is just a very you know micro health issue versus something waiting until they end up in the ER and then they end up having a very difficult time getting care to resolve their issue and then end up dying. And there's the same cor uh, corollary to law enforcement. LAPD was very vocal about the fact that they didn't want to push undocumented witnesses or people yeah. who might be able and to. And we've been yeah. seeing that here in New York City as well. And we saw with, uh, over the past year, ICE has been increasing their enforcement at local courthouses. Why would anyone who is seeking justice, a witness in a case, or someone who's defending themselves in court want to go to court when they know that they can get picked up by ICE. And I must say that was part of the problem in Honduras is women were either subject to domestic violence or rape, sexual violence, others, and they had no accountability in the court system. The rule of law just wasn't working and so therefore they, they felt endangered. Um, let's talk a little bit about DACA. Um, where are we on, on the state of play? Do you want to, you're nodding. Yeah, uh, so there are a number of people who applied for DACA. I think the number is over 700,000 people who have it currently. Um, the case is going to be heard on November 12th in the Supreme Court. And I think that right now, we no one knows how the Supreme Court is gonna move on this. If you look back at previous cases, it doesn't look so good, right? If you look at DAPA, for instance, which, which was stopped before it started, um, it, it looks grim. Um, I have hope for this uh, case to be successful. Um, my hope has failed in the past, but I'm really hopeful that we are not putting up 700,000 plus people's lives put on risk at this point. Can you outline the Supreme Court case? Sure. I'm uh, sorry, I didn't mean for this to be a pop quiz, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will give highlights and then I'll give it to. Well, maybe Elora could do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Trump administration tried stopping the program a number of times and has been stopped by the courts. Uh, and the last time they did uh, try stopping it, they, they didn't give a reason. So the lower court said you didn't give a reason why you want to stop this case, why you want to stop this program, other than you don't want it. Um, and then that's what ended up in the Supreme Court. So I think at this point, it, everything's open for what can be discussed. This program has gone through a number of different jurisdictions. There's a number of different lawsuits that have uh, come up to defend the DACA program. Um, and now I think a couple of them have been combined at the Supreme Court, um, which will move forward. But I'll pass it to the- I say one sure, thing sure, before my- yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, broad majorities of both parties support the Dreamers, DACA, et cetera. This is a no-brainer. This is more of a failure of our system. And really, I see is that this is Congress's role, is to cure these types of problems. And they don't take it up, so it's a massive problem. Now I turn it over to my esteemed colleagues here. Sure, so I'll just add to their remarks. The DACA case is for dreamers. It's for those who have come to the United States under the age of 16 and have achieved certain educational benchmarks that enable them to be subject to temporary two-year reprieves from the threat of deportation and gave these this highly skilled group of folks access to work authorization in the United States. It is a critical, vital program for so many who are ingrained in our communities across the country. Now, the DACA case is a test of executive power. The Obama administration set up the program through an executive order, the same type of executive order that the Trump administration is now using to harm and undermine and demolish immigrant communities. And then the Trump administration rescinded DACA without giving any reasons. And so part of the claims that are arising are under a law called the Administrative Procedures Act. Should notice and comment rulemaking have been followed here? Is this rescission of DACA arbitrary and capricious? Those are the two of the main legal questions that will be addressed by the Supreme Court, as well as the broader question about how much authority does the executive have in our system of checks and balances. So during the Obama years, immigrants' rights advocates supported the use of 
executive orders to create the DACA program. But those, and the right attacked it, Republicans attacked it. And those same arguments that Republicans and the right are now made back then, immigrants' rights advocates are using now to attack the, this administration's executive uh, orders. So there's a question about consistency and how you use legal doctrine to achieve the answers and the solutions that you want. I'm going to add uh, one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience, because I really want participation. But just a question to the entire panel, and that is a sort of a global question about, you know, it's called awakening democracy. How do you think these immigration issues are playing out in the electorate, and, and, and how might they, um, you know, in, in a variety of different ways, play out? Well, first of all, I don't think that the American people are as divided as we think on the issue of immigration. Um, however, the media portrayal of it and our perception of it has been really affected by the increasing polarization of the two parties, but also the party in charge right now and the person in charge in the White House is on the extreme of the right wing. And therefore, you know, you have this perception that there is a contingency among our population that is really very anti-immigrant um, to begin with. However, if I were to just take you back a few years, I mean, um, 1986 was the last time we had a comprehensive immigration reform called IRCA. And since then, there have been multiple efforts that try to reform the system. And what I want to convey is that every single one of these efforts in 01, 03, 05, 06, 07, and more recently 2012, 2014, have always been bipartisan. There was support on both sides for the reform because both the, the left and the right recognized the importance of immigration to this country for different reasons. The left are more progressive and more liberal, and therefore they are by definition, pro-immigrant, um, and they, you know, celebrate the multiple contributions that immigrants make into uh, or make to American lives. The right actually need immigrants because they recognize that those are the very people who work in the jobs that most Americans do not want, including African Americans. Think Katrina. In the aftermath of Katrina, the rebuilding of that entire city was on the backs of Latin American immigrants because even African Americans who grew up in New Orleans refused to take those jobs because those jobs involved going into the basements of these terribly kind of, you know, <coughs> torn homes and bringing out bodies, dead bodies of people who have been there for months. So make no mistake about it, the right recognized that, you know, if we don't have the immigration that we do have over the last half century, um, our way of life, so to speak, would be sort of worse off because we couldn't afford to live so comfortably uh, without the lawnmowers, the, um, the, um, the maid, the nannies, and the babysitters on basically being paid slightly below that which they deserve um, to maintain now so called middle class lifestyle for most of us. Well, and it's interesting to note the economic statistic recently that there was more new hires, majority of non-white new hires in the most recent employment statistics. Um, I'm gonna raise your hand and get a microphone to you or you can get to a microphone. We're gonna collect three questions and then we'll fire them off rapid fire to the panel. Yes. Hello, hi. Um, so, I am so thankful that everyone is here because uh, um, I'm definitely looking to learn more in order to make more informed decisions. Um, so my question is, um, so I'm working with un unaccompanied minors right now. And one thing that I learned or that I'm learning is that um, for the year, I think of refugees and asylum, asylum seekers, there it's re it's been reduced so it used to be higher i think maybe 80,000 then it went down to 30 and then a couple of weeks ago i found out it's down to 18,000 and then i received um an email of an executive order done on September 26 that says that 
uh, will allow states and localities to restrict the resettlement of refugees in their areas. The executive order directs that within 90 days of the date of the order, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Health and Human Services shall resettle refugees only in areas where both state and local governments consent in writing to the, re the, to the resettlement of refugees in their respective areas. And so I guess it's sort of a question just to get more information on, on this and how it impacts uh, this community. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's one question. Oh. Let's get two more. My, uh, <laughs> I was asked to say my name. I'm Cynthia Moreno. I'm with the School of Social Work here. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Cynthia. Uh, two more. There's one over there and one over here. Hi there, my name is Bridget and I am a first year law student. When I went down to visit the border, I noticed that people were reporting really terrible conditions that we would never accept in our jails. People have, uh, have no changes of clothes, they have no access to showers, toothbrushes, and things like that. How is that not a violation of the Constitution? How is that allowed under our understanding of cruel and unusual punishment and things like that? Thank you for the question. I saw one more hand back in the corner. Um, hello, my name is Jose Carlos, and I'm a student at Columbia College. I'm from the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, and my question is, do you think the perception of the southern border affects how we view immigration, generally speaking? Um, thank you. Uh, those are great questions. So who wants to tackle the first? Yes, Murad, go ahead. So New York State has uh, actually resettled thousands upon thousands of refugees across our state, specifically in upstate New York, where we've seen a huge loss of population. Once manufacturing died, people left looking for other jobs. And in western and central New York, we have a lot of farms. We have a lot of, um, pretty much just a ton of jobs, but no one there. And the refugee resettlement programs have been hugely welcomed in upstate New York. So that executive order you're mentioning is kind of not a thing because communities already have to want to have the refugee program. States have to agree to taking in people. This was tried before, um, but this is time it's like election season, we're gonna keep doing more and more harmful things. The reduction of 18,000 people into the refugee resettlement program as a whole is horrendous. What this administration is trying to do is demolish the infrastructure that took decades to build to help people once they got here. Um, so the, on the resettlement number of 18,000, that's something that pretty much is, we have 20,000 people who are already in the queue who were ready to come here. So we're looking at a real hurtful uh, <coughs> policy right now at reducing the number from 30,000 to 18, but also knowing that we <coughs> have historically had infrastructure built for um, resettlement, and now that infrastructure has been slowly been getting uh, bulldozed by this administration so that if there is a new presidency and he wants to bring in new, uh, increase the number, or she wants to increase the number to, um, for refugees, it's gonna take some time for the infrastructure to be rebuilt. Um, so that is like the long-term harm that this administration's also proactively engaging in. Can I, can I uh, add to that? Sure. So on the first question, the Refugee Act of 1980 set the initial cap for the number of refugees to be admitted to the United States as 30,000. And the refugee cap applies when U.S. government officials go abroad to refugee camps, screen people abroad, and then give them a visa that allows them to travel to the United States. It differs from asylum seekers who must first physically set foot in the United States before claiming asylum, before saying, I'm too afraid to go back to my home country. And if you look at the historical data, the number of refugees permitted to the United States has steadily gone up from 1980 onwards with a slight dip around September 11, 2001. And it peaked in the last year of the Obama administration when the cap was set at 110,000. And there were leaks from the administration that the refugee cap for the upcoming year was going to be zero. And the number has been set at 18,000. But given the dramatic slowdowns in processing, the 
evisceration of the staff needed to process visas and allow people into the United States, we shall see if the United States meets that number. And you also quoted from the last lines of the executive order requiring that state and local law and for state and local municipalities must agree before refugees are resettled. I want to be clear, that is unconstitutional. States and localities are not permitted under our US Constitution, under the Fifth Amendment, to discriminate on the basis of alienage and national origin. I think you're gonna see litigation challenging that part of the executive order before long. Now I want to go to your question, the second question. How can this be happening in America to children? We have two legal fictions that allow this to happen. The first is that our entire immigration system is not a penal system. So the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, it doesn't apply. So when a person is in immigration detention, when they're subject to deportation, even when their life is at risk, that's a civil issue. It's not criminal. So it doesn't give rise to cruel and unusual punishment as contemplated by the Eighth Amendment. So that is one fiction. The other fiction that contributes to the mess that we're seeing in immigration detention centers is that those who are in what's called expedited removal proceedings do not have constitutional rights. That is the administration's position. So even if you've set foot in the United States and you have been detained for months, for longer than a year, even if you're a baby, a toddler, the administration's position is that the Constitution's protections do not apply to you. This was tested about three years ago in a case involving mothers and children, all asylum seekers, detained in Berks, Pennsylvania. They had been subject to what, in my view, is serious process problems that resulted in negative determinations on the first screening step for seeking asylum, which is called a credible fear interview. And the question was, can these moms, children, can these very young kids be allowed to file what's called a writ of habeas corpus, saying my detention is unlawful, my detention violates the Constitution. A federal court of appeals from the Third Circuit said no. The writ of habeas corpus does not apply to surreptitious fugitives entering our borders. A different court of appeals, the Ninth Circuit more recently, reached the opposite conclusion as to whether the writ of habeas corpus applies to those in expedited removal proceedings. But this is the type of circuit split, we call it in the law, when two federal courts of appeals reach squarely opposite conclusions, that is likely to reach the Supreme Court. If I could add a footnote to this question, I would say that there is also this fascinating denial in the administration of what's happening. So when you go to these camps, you saw the actual living conditions that you describe aptly. But in the public discourse, when you ask the officials who are running these places, they deny that this actually is happening. They actually even said publicly that um, the children under our custody are basically given enhanced you know, well-being and care, um, and certainly are being taken care of uh, extremely uh, well by, by the staff members. So this, this is actually a lie, if you will, um, to the public about the actual condition that's happening. I want to come back to the first question also to add a footnote and to contextualize it because I wanted to raise the numbers of asylees as well. Um, on average, in 2017, we got 260,000 applicants to the asylum process in the US, and we grant 10% of them. So we admitted about 26,000 um, asylees uh, roughly every year. So some people are arguing, well, maybe the increase in the number of asylees is offsetting the decrease in the number of refugees because these two categories are deeply interconnected. 
But really what the Trump administration is trying to do is to demolish the entire system and wanted everything to go down to zero. Um, and this is, I think, criminal. And why? Criminal not in the sense that it's unlawful or illegal. But it is. But it is criminal in the But it is. Sense. It is unlawful is and it? illegal to violate the Refugee Act to which the United States is a party. That's and it also violates federal statutes that require the president to follow the law. But go I ahead. I appreciate that. <laughs> I was using the term criminal in a, in a more colloquial sense because right now when you look across the world, we have 72 million people who are displaced. 72 million, the highest in our entire history. And it's roughly 0.8% of the world's population. Um, 26 million of them are refugees, and about 3.5 million of them are asylum seekers. Okay? Think about that. 26 million of refugees across the world. And annually, we, re we resettle about 9 to 10, well, nine to 10,000 of them. So when you think about the number of refugees that we actually, I'm sorry, not 9 to 10,000, 900 to 90,000 to 100,000 every year. When you think about 26 million on one hand and 10, 10, uh, 100,000 on the other hand, we can see that the need for refuge across the world is highest than ever before, and the capacity and co the compassion for refuge, or pr to provide refuge, has basically decreased to basically zero. And this is criminal because the US has a long history of being the leader of the world. In fact, for a long time, we admitted more refugees into our country than the rest of the world combined until obviously 2016 when everything changed. And one could argue it is a big part of our strength as a nation. Um, I want to get another round of questions. I see a hand up front, this hand, and a third. Uh, or we can take one from the back too, but I, I feel like we missed the folks up front last time. So yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Elle from SIPA. And I was hoping to get back to the idea of stabilization and what the US role should be. Um, given we understand the U.S.'s role in creating much of the destabilization in the Northern Triangle, as was discussed, does that leave a particular role for redress? Or does that indict our role looking to the future and we should stay out? And then how do humanitarian concerns play into all of this? The sheer violence, deaths, femicide, and all of that. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And then right here. Hi, I'm Drashti. I'm also a graduate student here at SIPA. Um, I was hoping that you all could speak a little bit about race in the conversation and how the attack on immigrants is particularly racial. Two quick things that come to mind. Um, I read a New York Times article this morning that said that the Trump administration is trying to collect the DNA of people in detention centers, mainly a brown space. And the second thing is that um, immigrants or who are not in detention centers, for example, here in New York, um, the Trump administration is trying to get individuals who are um, claiming to receive SNAP benefits that they would be ineligible for citizenship in the future, which are mainly brown and black folks. Uh, okay, and one more up here. Thank Hi, I'm that. Tommy. I'm a journalism student here at Columbia, and I'm looking into uh, workplace uh, harassment here in New York City, and what I've found is a whole load of new cases of employers threatening to call ICE or even calling ICE on their workers. And I was wondering with what you mentioned about how Americans actually need immigrants because they do the jobs they are not willing to do. Why have we seen a rise in this informing culture, this kind of see something, say something culture in the last you know few months? Great questions. Um, do one Why don't you we wanna? do the harassment question first with him? Okay. He's on the ground. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I'd, well, on the harassment piece, I think that there, if you read last week, the New York City Commission on Human Rights uh, put out a new guidance on, and law on if you harass someone based on their immigration status or threaten to call ICE on them, uh, you can be fined up to a quarter of a million dollars. Um, I think that the increase in 
I, I wouldn't even necessarily call it an increase right now, but in uh, play, workplace ICE uh, enforcement, um, that's been happening for quite some time right now. And I think that the uh, piece here is that because we are not hearing it very often, we think it doesn't happen, but it does. Um, and specifically, that the reason why that law that I just mentioned took effect was because last year, if you recall, in Queens, there was a landlord who was using people's immigration status against them to try to kick them out or hike up their rent significantly. Um, so I don't, I, I, I don't think, I'm trying to not think in a deficit-based uh, way of people, um, but I do think that there are just bad people out there who... Um, do this kind of malicious reporting. Um, I actually wanted to answer this question um, that our sister in red uh, brought up about uh, race and immigration. And I think it's important to know that although like African and black immigrants are about 5% of the immigration population, they're about 20% of the people in uh, detention and uh, going through a deportation proceeding. And that's huge. Um, so when we're talking about how this country has seen race for a very long time, um, it perpetuates in every aspect of every system. So I don't want us to think about you know, the black and brown immigration uh, processes, it being skewed towards one way or the other, but it is very bad for people of color. Um, specifically on your question about SNAP benefits, that I think you're referring back to the public charge announcement that Department of Homeland Security announced a couple of weeks ago, um, which was a campaign we led in the state of New York to really push to get over 250,000 comments against the rule when it was first announced. Um, the, the final rule, I think, is already challenged in court. And what this rule change would do is determine someone's ability to adjust status. right? And people who are exempt from this final rule change that they announced are green card holders, uh, refugees, asylees, U visa holders, T visa holders, and a couple other people. But pretty much it's targeting um, other folks who have visas, as well as mostly undocumented people. Um, and pretty much public charge is a test that they give to see if you are going to be a burden on the public. And uh, social safety nets, such as SNAP and WIC and Medicaid, were never included in that kind of testing before. Um, and it was never intended to be included, and now it is. So what we even saw before the final rule came out was that people in droves were unenrolling mm -hmm. because they didn't want to um, really be impacted by this potential rule. The rule is set to take effect on October 15th if it isn't uh, held up in an injunction in court. Um, the state of New York actually filed, I think, one of the first lawsuits against that rule, um, and pretty much it's penalizing poor people for wanting to have a better life for their children. And I think that, and by better life, I mean literally feeding them or getting them health care or getting yourself food and getting yourself health care. So race and class have always played a part within uh, the immigration system. And I think it, in, under this administration, it's only... Uh, gotten significantly worse when you have the president saying we want more people from Finland um, coming to this country. He really means he just does, doesn't want people of color coming here. I know we're short on time, so I want to make three quick points that answer some of these questions. Uh, one of them is economic development in the Northern Triangle is critical. Number two, we have to think about the war on drugs and how our own public policy here at home is destabilizing these countries, how we deal with drugs, et cetera. And number three, I want to make sure that we're not only focused on the low end jobs. If you go among Silicon Valley founders, a disproportionate amount of their parents or grandparents are immigrants. So immigrants actually provide jobs at the top, at the bottom, and everywhere in between. And it's an important part of our economic future. The Dallas Fed recently came out and said, hey, if we keep on putting the brakes on immigration, we're going to slit our own throats in terms of Social Security, Medicare, and all those programs that support the old people. You need a, a healthy population pyramid, and much like the Eurozone, we're starting to age as a society. So immigration is an important part of our economic future. And I think that that cannot be negated in this whole topic. And I think we have to think about immigration not being a vacuum. It's very integrated with every other issue in public policy.
So on the question of, ab of, of, of abuse, I would say that it raises the broad issue of why we are letting 11 million undocumented immigrants living in the shadow of our society, and therefore we must have immigration reform um, so that they can get on a path to naturalization so that they have some basic protections. That would be my answer to that. Van, you made the point that it's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please finish. I was going to go to the race question. Oh, please, yes. And connect that to the previous question asked by our undergraduate at the back about the southern border. And yes, the answer is our borders are tremendously racialized because we don't think about the northern border. And more importantly, um, we don't think about the 600,000 visa overstayers who are also in so many ways undocumented because they came in through uh, more legal means and most of these people are from Europe um, and they sort of blended into our society. 600,000 is a fraction of 50 million who <coughs> enter the U.S. every year, 1.33 percent roughly, but it's still a sizable number and they just stayed. And I think that distinction, right, in our mind about what is, who is an undocumented person is often a Latino, a Mexican, someone from Central American uh, <laughs> countries, but not from the other side. And that, I think, is a narrative that we must change in dealing with this question of undocumentation. And I just want to add one last thought on the question of the border and the question of race. I don't know if you all had a chance to look at the New York Times, but this week the Times published as an expose about what happened at an executive office meeting in March of this year when the president said that there should be alligators stalking the river between the United States and Mexico. And if that's not possible, all the migrants, all the refugees seeking refuge in the United States should be shot. In the legs. In the legs. Um, so I want to do one more set of questions. We have less than 10 minutes. We have about five minutes, right? Three quick questions. Let's start. Uh, I'll let you, yeah, I'll let you pick. Um, Hi. Oh. My Hi. name is Trisha. Um, I'm a human rights student at CC. And recently we saw this debate among our elected representatives um, about what strategy we should use to alleviate the situation at the border. There are all these horrible things going on. Um, and some people were saying that we should give CBP and the DHS money so that they can make um, the situation better. And we saw other elected representatives saying that we should completely withdraw funding for the operations at the border. Um, and a lot of you have these flyers in this room um, that Colombia itself has a $150,000 contract with Border Patrol. Um, so Colombia is kind of taking a stance on this ideological question too, um, and they're refusing to end their contract. So I was just wondering what your thoughts on this debate are. Thank you for the question. In the back? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I actually also wanted to ask about um, Colombia's contract with Border Patrol and ICE. Um, if you all didn't know, Colombia receives $150,000 for a contract they signed in May like well into all of these horrible like human rights abuses going on. Um, Colombia signed a contract to offer medical support at the border, but um, I feel like personally if they wanted to provide medical support, they would just do that and wouldn't take money from ICE, the same agency that, uh, you know, we have these panels where we talk about like all the problems with the immigration system and the organizations that operate it and like how horrible they are to the people who have to suffer under it. Um, just seems like kind of hypocritical to me to have these types of panels um, when the university itself actually receives money from the same organization committing these human rights atrocities. Um, so I just want to know what you all think um, about Colombia's contract with ICE. Um, and I also wanted to know if uh, Goldberg or um, Ishel also is in the room, I believe, if you all wanted to speak on um, how the university should respond and move forward. Um, receiving $150,000 from Border Patrol, what you all are going to do about that. Thank Got you. It. Thank you for the question. We have one more. I don't want to direct because you tell me, you can just pass the <laughs> microphone. Sorry. Hi, uh, I'm Katya. I'm a student at the law school. Uh, and I was actually curious kind of about local positive efforts uh, in the face of this kind of federal onslaught. 
I'd love to learn about kind of uh, either grassroots policies, municipal policies, city policies that have actually managed to protect these populations. Um, I'm going to start in the back just by saying that there's going to be a separate panel addressing your question. It's an important one, and it's not necessarily for this forum, but I, I acknowledge your question, and I just want you to know that if you guys want to talk about it, feel free, but jump at any other questions. Uh, I'll answer the first question. I don't know very much about this contract with CBP and the school. Um, but I do think that the question that was first brought up about asking elected officials to not support more funding for CBP and ICE and DHS is an appropriate one. And we are actually running a not one more dollar campaign for them uh, because what they're using, what initially you're referring back to uh, continuing resolution, Department of Homeland Security needs funding every year through appropriations to continue to do their work. Um, and if you recall, about a year ago, there was a government shutdown um, that happened in the federal government. And there was a deal brokered by the House and the Senate. And then everything just fell apart because Trump was like, I'm not signing this. Uh, so the last effort that you're, I think you are referring to is uh, the last continuing resolution of pretty much people were telling Congress to not give them any more additional resources to expand detention and holding people at the southern border um, and also to start defunding them as well um, and what had been agreed was that they would provide more humanitarian resources funding for the southern border and then what ended up happening is that got scuttled by one of our s senators here in new york and then pretty much they got an uh, additional money to do whatever they wanted, uh, thinking that they were going to do the right thing and provide humanitarian funding I resources at the southern border. And there was a push for defunding ICE, I think, too, at least at grassroots one. Go ahead. Right. And just to add some more context to that, that response, in June of this year, the administration argued that argued before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, so a federal appeals court, that the Flores Settlement Agreement does not require the government to provide children in federal immigration custody with toothbrushes, with toothpaste, with beds, with soap. And then a group of lawyers and I went to Clint and we spoke out vocally about what are the consequences of that position. And then the administration claimed, oh, well, we can't provide those things because we don't have enough money. If you look at DHS's annual appropriations, it is about $60 billion. But the president and the vice president and acting DHS secretary Kevin McAleenan all said, first, what we were saying was fake news. But second, even if it was true, it was because they didn't have enough money to provide basic things to children. So they used that narrative to justify getting passed through both houses a $4.6 billion supplemental DHS appropriations bill at the very end of June. Now, if you break down that bill, $1.9 billion from that bill, up to $1.9 billion of that bill, goes to providing additional money for juvenile detention centers for children. So it is the exact opposite of what immigrants' rights and children's rights advocates like me were pushing for. It's a tragedy. A footnote to this, the proposed budget for 2020 for DHS is actually $71 billion. And just to put this into context, the entire budget for the Department of Education is $61 billion. So we're spending more money on the board on the South, which has been proven to be extremely ineffective from stopping people because we have to address the causes of the migration flows. And we are increasing personnel and equipment and everything else in between um, to build this wall symbolically or practically, but it's not going to stop any immigration. Instead, we're not investing in some of the more fundamentally and uh, more crucial aspects of our society that would actually help those who are in the middle of the country who felt that they're being left behind 
those who actually are now, you know, part of what we call the politics of resentment, you know, the Americans who are feeling aggrieved because they felt that they have lost status given the fact that immigration has been continuing for half a century. Um, back to the contract question, I just say one thing. Colombia has thousands and thousands of contracts with various governmental agencies, um, and therefore one out of thousands is really one that we can talk about it, but let's just remember it should be in the broader context. And I no longer work for Colombia, so I'm not defending Colombia in any way. Um, but the second thing is the provision of medical services is so crucial right now. So I actually would, would be willing to say let's get people there, let's get the resources there to help these children who are in crisis. And then deal with the broader question as to whether or not we should accept $160,000 from um, ICE. And let's leave it at that. I have one very broad comment that I think is very important to this conversation. We are all privileged because we're sitting here in New York. Middle America is dying economically, and a lot of these feelings, a lot of this racism, a lot of this nativism is coming from that. If you've been in Middle America, it is in an irreversible decline. And I think we would be amiss not to mention that on this panel. I am not from Middle America. I have a lot of cousins that are from there. And when I spend more time there, it's not that I sympathize with them, but I come to understand how they arrive at these feelings. And while I feel these feelings are fundamentally misguided, they are definitely affecting our daily politics and American life in general. Those, any other closing thoughts? I think we're about out of time, right, Suzanne? Um, th yeah, we're out of time. Yes, go ahead. L let, I'll let you close out, as they say. One quick last thought. I think that we're in uh, the fight of our lifetime. And you will remember this moment and say to yourself, what did I do to, do it, to change anything that is happening at this moment? There are a number of different ways that you can en become engaged in this process. You can join a local organization, help work on policy. You can help direct resources to organizations that are doing the work on the ground. You can start organizing on your campus, as some of you are already doing here. Um, but we have a very critical moment that's upon us in the next year. And it's going to be incumbent on every single person in this room, your family and your friends, to actually do work to turn out people to vote. And at the end of the day, that is what is going to be the moment where we decide the direction of how do we continue to you know, be angry or do we continue to really drive change and by doing that at the ballot box of people who we're gonna hold accountable because they've hurt our communities. And that is not partisan in any way. But register yourselves to vote, register your families to vote, sign up with the organizations to actually hit the ground running starting now. Don't wait until next year, start now. I know you guys just started semester re relatively soon. Uh, you should be getting into midterms and then that'll be a good place for you to start looking at what you can do outside of Columbia. You can do as much as you want in the school, but like outside of Columbia. You guys are in Harlem. Get to know Harlem. Don't be the stereotypical, we came to Columbia and then we were just gentrifiers for a year or two and then left. <laughs> no offense or anything, but start giving back to the communities that you guys are in and doing that here or back at home. Yes, Van. One final thought, and it is, it is about the longer history. A hundred years ago, right now, in 1919, there was also a tremendous backlash against three decades of immigration from Europe, which eventually led to the passage of the 1924 Immigration Act, which stopped most of migration from all over the world. We are now at the same moment, half a century of continuing immigration has arrived, and now we are seeing that backlash again. The difference, though, is that no, no longer can we isolate ourselves you know, the way we did 100 years ago, because we now live in a much more globalized and deeply interconnected world. So the choice is really in front of us, which is, do we want to live our lives, and do we want to, our society to be a closed-off system being so fearful of everything that's coming in, or do we want to open up our values of compassion and kindness and generosity to receive refugees and immigrants from all over the world? I myself am a refugee, and I wouldn't be sitting here if it were not for the generosity of the Refugee Resettlement Program, um, which brought my family 21 years ago. So I actually think 
we should always take the higher road and think about what America stands for and what values we hold dear and, 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 and close to our hearts, and let that be our guide for actions. It's a brilliant way to close. Thank you, Van. Thank you so much to the panel, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. And I'll, I'll ask you in a moment to join me in thanking our panel again. I have three quick uh, points to, to share with all of you. First, we very much think of these awakening our democracy conversations as the beginning, not the end of a conversation. So picking up on what each of you has said in various ways, we ask that you take these conversations out to your classes, to your classmates. You'll receive the YouTube video from us. Please share it out as you like. Second, um, if you are interested, as I know a number of you are, in the additional conversation about the Columbia contract issue, please let us know at universitylife at columbia.edu so that we can work on trying to arrange this at a time when the uh, largest number of people possible will be able to join us. Third, this Friday, the Task Force on Inclusion at Belo and Belonging at Columbia, which University Life convenes, will be meeting. So check out the University Life website for more information. We'd welcome all of you. Finally, please join me in thanking our incredible panel and Juju Chang for really a wonderful conversation. We look forward to seeing you at more Awakening Our Democracy conversations in the semester ahead. Thank you all.